Lately on this channel, we've been seeing what Mario's partners can do on their own when tasked with beating the game without Mario doing anything. It's a lot of fun, we've made tons of memories. But lately, I felt... nostalgic. Whatever happened between us, Mario? The sea is drift apart. The game, after all, is Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door. And then it hit me. I should be thinking about Mario and how he feels. Stuck doing nothing but just existing. Being along for the ride while his friends have all the fun. How dare you insult me in my own home! I'm sorry, your lordship. Let's address this grave sin by having Master Mario stretch his bones and body the world. Since some fans like to refer to March 10th as Mario Day, it seemed like a missed opportunity to not get this video out ahead of Yoshi, Goombella, and maybe even Flurry's third go round in this game. However, he's done his first up around this game years ago, so let's make things a little more interesting. In addition to having no use for partners in battle, we will also deny him his star powers. No sweet treat, no power lift, no art attack, none of that. This is just to put him on more equal footing with his pals. He also can't buy items from shops, at least since that's required. Will he prove to be a cut above the rest, or will this be a plumber's lament? Let's find out! It's SHOWTIME! After Lord Crump disgraces me in our very first battle, thank you JDA Steer for sharing how this is even possible, we are now primed to begin our adventure. Looking at Mario's tools, he can use his jump or his hammer to do damage. Jumping will deal 1 damage per hit, while the hammer strike puts all that damage out at once, enabling him to do 2 damage as well as damaging enemies with spikes on their head. Something you no doubt have already noticed as well is that Goombella is slumped on the ground. She and all of my other partners have their max HP set to 0 so they cannot interfere in battle. Yes, all of my other partners. Mario is going to be carrying the whole squad on his back. Unfortunately, there's nothing particularly special we can do with only Gubella on the field, so we're just going to mosey on down to the Thousand Year Door where our map gives us a light show, and we proceed to check out the Star Power tutorial. Because even though I ban special moves, it's generally a good practice to show your audience more so than just tell them what your rules are. There is also our introduction to badges, and since Mario is the subject today, we have access to all of his move granting badges as well. Power Smash is the first, and it essentially doubles the damage we can do with Mario's hammer in a single swing. Blooper as a fight is also very easy, as attacks from it do at most 1 damage if you don't guard. Needless to say, we guard. A lot. Since we can get by with either jumping or hammering the tentacles, it's needless to say nothing here gives Mario any trouble whatsoever. So, since I have some time, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to subscribe. Trust me when I say I hate doing this more than you hate hearing it, as I want to give my viewers value before asking anything of you, but my dad asked me to do it near the beginning and I love my dad, so consider it, okay? Thanks. There is nothing standing between us in Chapter 1 now, so let's proceed through the vibrant, peaceful pet of meadows where... Apparently dragons roam. No matter, I suppose. We had no forced fights between here and Petalburg, and before too long, we're off the Shuang Fortress. A few more items appear to us like PAL blocks, which almost immediately become useful. Bald clefts aren't too reliant on PAL blocks, power smash cuts through just fine. But for bristles, they're essentially required as they're spiky, and their spears poke Mario if he approaches with his hammer. A shame, really. Piercing below would be nice to use here. But it really is just PAL block or bust. A quick quiz show later where we answer every question correctly because we can do basic addition, and it's just a sloggy slugfest in Shuang Fortress. Something that annoys me a bit is that Fuzzies have 3 HP, which is just above what Mario can do in one turn without FP. We have received a couple of Fire Flowers, and I doubt we'll need these for later, but I decided to just toughen that without them anyway. I should confess that I did a super guard here against the Fuzzy holding a mushroom, because attacking directly would have made the fight last longer, as enemies of healing items always use them when anyone is damaged. But don't worry, I don't plan on super guarding in any meaningful way throughout the rest of this video. In short, I went and exterminated the vermin like I'm the verminator. Gold Fuzzy, likewise, was just a hammer swing, a power smash, and a power jump away from Oblivion. Couldn't care less really about the horde that summoned, as nothing here does more than one damage. Now that we have the Sun and Moonstones, we may not be able to evolve this gloomy place into a Bellossom, but we can recruit Coop and proceed to Hooktail Castle. 
more pressing though are the fights within Hooktail Castle. I actually didn't bother going inside yet because I wanted to snag something helpful from Rungport now that we have Coops, so that we can actually complete Chapter 1 at a reasonable level, as I don't like relying on Attack Effect Sorry for Hooktail, and don't have access to Mega Rush since Mario's copy of the badge isn't available until after Chapter 1 is completed. Believe it or not, we can get the Ultra Hammer now. Thanks to Zest T when we stop under contact lenses. We can set up a glitch called Jump Storage, where we deploy Coops behind her kitchen, and then interact with her cutscene where she gets mad at us for not listening to her when she set out to move. Guess it's my man-like selective hearing at work. Anyways, we can jump over to the Ultra Hammer chest and pick it up now. I actually chose to purposefully draw Mario after setting this glitch up so I can do it again later. Now you may find this to be cheap, seeing that the Ultra Hammer is three times as strong as Mario's basic hammer, but it's unfortunately necessary to pick up now if we don't want to rely on a future partner for help. Makes the rest of Chapter 1 relatively free though. Using the Super Hammer skill in battle means we can wipe out the Dull Bones in a single turn, and it won't matter at all what Red Bones does then. Attack, it dies next turn. Build the Buddy Workshop behind it, Super Hammer. Ahead, free Star Points. Checkmate. Hook Tail is easy too. You normally are intended to use a badge tied to a weakness, which I totally would do if I didn't have the Ultra Hammer right now, but I do. I have just an HP plus and last stand equipped alongside the obligatory peekaboo for my audience. The hammer we have does 5 damage after Hooktail's defense. Hooktail herself can hit pretty hard, but we have 4 HP at worst, while Hooktail will just have lost her additional 20 HP. Mario proceeds to try and give Hooktail's speed a good store like Darkseid Phil subscribed to her OnlyFans. Yeah, bad call. Nonetheless, we're a mushroom and horse still away from safety, and two more hammer swings give us a W. You pick if you're worried, by the way, about the Ultra Hammer being game-breaking later in the game, well, it actually does end up being a great tool for us. And I don't really feel too bad about it. CTYD, for whatever reason, really hates giving the hammer relevance in battle. After all, we have Power Bounce now, and access to Mario's copy of Mega Rush. But having the Ultra Hammer already, it will be able to perform a respectable niche when used alongside our jump. Which is great, because of all the ways this game lets you strike multiple times in one attack, jumping tends to outclass the hammer pretty much everywhere. Even in this video, it will happen sooner than later. I know regarding my rules as though I don't wish to use my coins for items, I don't have as much of a problem with the finite badges you're allotted. So while Charlatan's badges and the lovely house of badges are on the table, Stuff like dropped badges and the Pianta Parlor will be off limits. The next few bosses will be relatively simple to take out. The Shadow Sirens, for example, are generally two shot by Mario's hammer. This fight's simply not an issue for us. Most key, however, are the Super Boots giving us a more powerful jump attack. That now sees Jump do 2 plus 2 as opposed to 1 plus 1. Could hardly tell though with Magnus Von Grapple. The mech has a point of defense just like Hooktail, so resorting to instead using the hammer here is actually still optimal. Alongside Damage Dodge, if you want to jump, badges like Jumpman and Multibounce would prove to work well here. Your damage isn't quite as high as with the hammer, but you're not in any danger as Magnus' Stomp can't hurt you if you guard. The x fist can be more dangerous, but they can't attack on the same turn they're deployed. So Multibounce can wipe them out, making your HP last all day if necessary. It's slower though, so if you want this fight to be faster, you can instead equip Last Stand and Mega Rush. This badge boosts Mario's attack by 5 when he has only 1 HP, so after a warm-up wind-up and 3 basic swings of your hammer, you can T-pose in front of the fist like you're a 10-year-old kid in the rain, and if you start it with 10 HP, you'll be guaranteed to reach 1. The reason you want to miss a hammer swing on purpose on your first attack is so Magnus doesn't realize the danger he's in. Until his HP falls to 20, he won't fire the X-Fist and will instead just try to stomp, so take advantage of that. Chapter 3 is probably the chapter that will see some people comment ahead of time that this challenge is impossible. Well, if you do, I give my viewers full permission to let the right simply at you. Like this. <laughs> Since we already have the Ultra Hammer, we have no use for the Super Hammer we typically get halfway through the chapter. And we don't really have much need for Yoshi right now either. Maybe asking, how is that the case? Isn't it impossible to beat the Armored Harriers without the Yoshi Kid? Well, of course. Fortunately, this case of Color Splash game design can be skipped entirely by just instead notioning to steal the champ's belt. My partners may think I'm just being facetious, but I'm deathly serious. Emphasis on death. On death. Straight up. So after Grubba gives us a tour of the glitch pit, we say no to signing the contract, spin jump onto his bookshelf, walk out, and walk back in using our handy dandy Ultra Hammer to pave the way forward where we can read about the stuck machine that talks about the ring Grubba's been secretly holding. We'll focus on the elephant in the room later concerning how we'll access Chapter 4 without Yoshi helping us reach it. 
Don't worry, I have a plan. Let's just enjoy the here and now, okay? Good. We then proceed to engage Grubba, and he becomes Macho. Worst part? I skipped a leg day. Our level is... dangerously low. Being like level 3, we can be blown over really easily since we skipped a ton of otherwise guaranteed star points making our way through the Glitz Pit. However, when you have Power Bounce, Mega Rush, Power Rush, and Last Send all for options, I think it becomes fairly obvious what your first resort can look like. In fact, despite our level disadvantage, we have the means to make this fight 100% winnable. A couple of hammer swings from the start, and we can then just react accordingly to what Grubba does. He buffs his attack, will fall to 3 HP, and can spin up the drop into 38 HP left. From there, you just have to react accordingly, and either go straight for the kill with Power Bounce, or chop on a horse tail in the Dryad Shroom you were forced to buy earlier and proceed to Power Bounce on the turn he makes him so fast again. You see, no matter what Grubba does, his demise is inevitable. Even if he opts to boost his defense or grant himself dodgy status, we simply have to slow down to keep up with him. Even if Grubba never buffs his attack, all we'd have to do is defend and heal as needed. The Dried Shroom still comes into play, too, to keep us in danger so that no matter what Grubba does, he'll always do 2 damage. This is possible because of how Last Stand calculates damage, and since apparently y'all like when I go full-blown nerd over this game, allow me to explain. Grubba's attack power is 4, but attack up boosts damage output to 7. When Mario has 2 less stands equipped, the damage while his HP is 5 or less is reduced to only a third of its usual power. But if the number is in whole, it's rounded up, so a value of 1.5 is rounded up to 2. Grubba, whenever he makes himself dodgy or defensive, maintains his 4 attack power, which as long as Mario doesn't guard, would deal 1.33 damage. But because damage can't be a decimal, it's rounded up to 2. Alternatively, Grubba boosting his attack to 7, the damage would do 3, but unlike the other status buffs, you should actually guard it and reduce the damage to 6. And since Last Stand is calculated at the very end of damage calculation, that 6 damage will be reduced to a third of its power, and likewise deal only 2 damage. So we're able to make any damage Grubba can dish out consistently only ever be 2, and play around whatever he does with a horse tail or maybe a mushroom, guaranteeing he can never defeat us even if we get unlucky. The TLDR, Danger Status is busted, and Grubba answers to me. That's right ladies, gentlemen, and others. I'm the promoter, I'm the danger, I am the one who knocks. Even without being able to super guard, we're just a cut above him. Now to reach chapter 4, we simply just have to fight through the glitch pit normally and lose to the armored harriers, as the game will recognize we don't have a Yoshi yet and give us the egg so we can play the rest of the game normally. I learned this only recently when playing this game with only Miss Mouse for a previous video. Safe to say, I regret having to try and prove I can perform double frame perfect glitches all the way back with Vivian. The fights in Chapter 3's minor league are regardless not a problem for Mario at all. Since Mario's jump and hammer can both perform different roles, there is virtually nothing that fully stops him from being able to progress. So any items some lesser partners would need to use are simply unnecessary. We're able to see the birth of our Yoshi, who I named Zephyr. If you get the reference, you're based, and let no one tell you otherwise. Typically, I avoid extra fights unless I know I need the levels, but I do have plans for a future event at the end of the video. If you know, you know. Now let's take care of this dreary, dark, dank district identified as Twilight Town. Coming up next, the man with no name. I call him Zep Brown again, but I think Quinn's a good fit for him. Wouldn't you agree? Either way, this is considered by Manny to be the easiest boss in the game, where all we have to do is repeatedly jump on him. Whether through repeatedly selecting the jump action or using power bounce, just make like the demented pogo free Jolene believes us to be and win. With that done, this fool dupes my partners and ghosts me. And speaking of ghosts, let's bust Atomic Boo. This fight is best fought with Jumpman Sister Hammer can't reach. Just keep jumping on them. Spinship in particular does fairly well doing 8 damage out of their 40x HP. Once you're in danger, which ideally happens after 2 turns, Power Bounce will start doing 16 damage to the Amalgamation Abomination. Worst case scenario, you should have plenty of mushrooms to keep yourself afloat, and if you don't, Petunia has Mystic Aids if you need them. Though you really shouldn't need them if you know what you're doing. Keep attacking and you'll be fine. Then, after did them in Quinn, he decides to step up to me when he tries to hide back in his crib. What's nice here is not having a partner changes nothing about how we approach him. Amongst my badges are Double Pain and Last Stand. Why I'm using Double Pain is because it's actually a fairly effective tool to help manipulate damage for literally no cost except the Mario's health. Basically, if Quinn does attack with his hammer, 
He'll do 8 damage as opposed to 4, while Gumbella will proceed to do only 1 damage if I don't guard, and I can react accordingly to whatever Quinn attacks with next. Double Pain and Last Stand effectively cancel each other out, and I can take odd numbers of damage again, while Gumbella is still too weak to actually hurt me if I guard her attacks. Something I would do if Quinn manages to drop me to only 1 HP first. So I can guarantee dropping the Peril, and this fight can end in between 2 and 3 turns. Silly Quinn, double question mark. Partners are merely assistants. You're able to suspend his grub while relying on crystal stars as a crutch. True strength comes from within. And your badges. Definitely more so your badges. A fact that becomes ever more clear as we continue to limit our level ups on the Kindling Cove Keel Hall Key. The fights against the Embers here are best fought with Hammerman and Power Plus equipped so you can one shot each one at a time. Makes for a good bit of extra star points, so you bet I'm grateful to be forced to fight enemies right now. Cortez, meanwhile, eh, pretty pathetic. Each phase sees him have 20 max HP, and at the start, it's always your turn. So after he attacks you twice, provided you equip Mega Rage and Power Bounce, all you have to do is jump on the bone pile to take some damage, let Cortez hash thing and slash you, and then proceed to body him with Power Bounce three times in succession. So easy, even I can do it. This is actually faster if done with double paint equipped, so that you take 8 damage in a single hit as opposed to only 4. It saves just one turn, but hey, speed is speed. Lord Crump by comparison? Well, again, you should have plenty of defense boosting options, ranging from defend plus to 2 damage dodges. So you're free to cut his damage down to size. Good defense and good fundamentals tends to be all you need to seize to duel in the day. And yeah, we can't use Peril in Phase 1 reliably since it'll be Crump's turn once he heals, but all bets are off once Phase 2 happens. Let this be a lesson to you, Crumpet. We may have to get a little more crafty to properly deal with the future bosses though, as it's here the game is no longer easy. But we can pick up Double Dip at least, so that's worth celebrating. Never mind the fact that I actually forgot to get this match until probably through Chapter 8, just ignore that. Though sadly, our hammer is going to start losing its shine from here on out. Chapter 6 will bestow on us the Ultra Boots, and they're going to pretty much make our hammer obsolete. Pretty sad, but at least it had its chance to bonk some fools. And looking at Smorg now, it's time to show up just how much control we have over this pest. Going in with Power Bounce, Defend Plus, Power Rush, Mega Rush, Multi Bounce, and Jumpman, this fight can be won in as few as 3 turns. It's here you'll probably recognize what makes Mario's Solar Run so surprisingly easy to play around. It's because he's the only target bosses can aim for. Partners have to account both for themselves and Mario's survival, but Mario doesn't need partners to keep fighting. And that means there's no need to guess who a boss will target, because you know they can only ever target one character. It makes being able to aim for peril significantly easier, ironically, than if partners were allowed to help out. Back to Smorg, I defend first since I suck at guarding the Miasma attacks and we land in peril. Multi Bounce then wipes the other three Miasmas out immediately, and then Power Bounce. Our attack power in peril is well above the Miasma HP. And the damage we do with a 6 hit power bounce starting from 11 is 51, one point above Smorg's max HP. Yeah, I love Mega Rush. Chapter 7 is honestly not much harder either. After we collect the items available to fight here and deal with the Elite X dots we first encounter, we're free to beeline for Magnus too. For here, my HP is increased to 15 via HP+, and my other badges include Power Bounce, Power Rush, and Mega Rush. Oh, and PFD downs to increase the damage I take and dish out. It's important here that I take more damage. This is because I equipped Double Pain so that after I jump on him, Magnus 2 will deal 14 damage on my max 15 HP. I proceed to then use Power Bounce twice, doing about 39 damage per use of the move, and win in literally 3 turns. Yeah, that's Magnus 2 alright, cause it went down about twice as fast as the original. We're already in Chapter 8. Wow. To be honest, I suppose I gave Chapter 6 too much credit when Mario would be the subject here. But I know this is where the game starts getting hard. So before venturing inside the Palace of Shadow, I'd recommend buying Fire Drive from the Bad Shop in Rogueport. It will be a fairly useful badge when looking at the first encounter with Dark Bones. Here it feels like Fire Drive will be super useful as Mario otherwise lacks any good tools to properly deal with multiple targets at once. Unfortunately, the fact that Fire permanently defeats Dry Bones doesn't really do very much to help us here, as Dry Bones and Dark Bones can both create reinforcements when destroyed. And with our level as low as it is, we don't have a lot of FP to use. Trying to brute force this fight won't work, with just a little bit of bad luck being enough to make winning impossible. It's sad. 
even now, Mario is always teetering on death's door, and though we've been completely dominated all game so far, it doesn't take much to see Mario be flushed down the River Six. I find myself still relying on Power and Mega Rush to stay on track. The game plan now is to power balance and spin on Dark Bones while letting Mario take damage that reduces him to 1 HP by turn 3. Possible thanks to Last Stand, Damage Dodge, and Defend Plus. With just enough FP to let Fire Drive rip, Mario is able to strike all five enemies down in one foul swoop. Seems like the game is only now starting to prove its difficulty. Then again... So Gloomtail is kinda funny. With Jumpman, Power Bounce, Rush Badges, and Hecking HP Drain, Assuming you land in peril, which is not hard at all to really do, you can double up a Mr. Softener and Power Punch, dish out 27 damage before being healed to 4 HP, then Gloomtail will send you into peril with any of his attacks, as he has an attack power of 8, which gets reduced to 3 thanks to having 2 last stands, and Power Balance when backed by Mega Rush now does 57, meaning we win having done 84 damage in 2 turns. For the uninitiated, HP Drain reduces attack power by 1, but compensates by restoring 1 HP per attack. It's a usually lackluster badge, but it worked perfectly for what I wanted to do here. That alone is definitely a blowout if I ever saw one. And that's normally the Gatekeeper. By comparison, the Shadow Sirens were a lot trickier. And by that, I mean I just slept on a Sleepy Stomp and prayed that Marilyn would be sedated. We're once again rocking 10 max HP, and assuming Marilyn falls asleep, I just need to guard both Quinn and Bellatham's attacks. They have attack powers of 6 and 5 respectively, but when guarded the total damage is 9, letting us quickly reach peril. From there, I can just power bounce Quinn to knock him out from max HP, knowing Bellatham will just try to make me slow. Even if she succeeds though, all she will do next turn is make someone on her team fast. I'm honestly surprised we just haven't needed to level up more than what the required fights are, Minus a couple of optional mini-bosses to get some decently consistent, if not guaranteed, wins against the bosses even- Wait. There are different types of sages in this game? Jeez. Still, it's a wonder I don't even use some of those status badges more often considering Mario hardly even has a use for status items, or even special moves like Clockout when he can just cast statuses like Sop and Sleep using badges alone. I just hate them like I never bothered to use them, but they do come in handy. Grotus and the following fight against Bowser and Kami Koopa actually are a lot less easy to plot around given there are two consecutive fights in between with no chance to save. And the fact that Grotus always has roughly three defense and his AI can allow him to do anything after turn one where he's invincible means luck is guaranteed to be a factor. Still, I had a plan, as uncertain as it would be to work. After striking down the four Grotus X's he starts with, I figured that Grotus must be kinda sleepy given the poor guy has been worried sick over how I've been clowning at his henchmen all game, so I put him out of commission. I may not be a mechanic, but I know how to press the power off button. Since Sleepy Sheep is only a 30% chance to work though, I double dip both Sleepy Sheep by half to boost the odds of Grotus falling asleep. Then I am just letting the Grotus X's damage me a bit with some guards before eliminating one of them. You might be wondering what I'd do if both Grotus X's fell asleep to my Sleepy Sheep? Well, don't worry, because that's impossible. They're immune to sleepiness, which is something you can't guarantee with, say, stopwatches. Which is why I called for Mr. Sandman and not Dialga. Now that Grotus has only one Grotus X left, giving him only two defense and I have only one HP, I can power bounce him. And with my Rush Badges, Jumpman, Power Plus, and the new All or Nothing Badge found in Chapter 8, which is essentially a cheaper Power Plus that demands we hit our action commands to do damage, something I would never miss because what kind of pro would I be if I screwed up every now and then, we can put this brave little toaster right out with the rest of the scrap in the junkyard. We level up HP, since I think it'd be beneficial for all future fights, and it will in fact be necessary for my idea with fighting the bosses immediately afterwards. So regarding Bowser and Kami Koopa, RNG can be a real pain in the neck. What with Bowser being able to choose between three different attacks, and Kami having magic that can cause all sorts of obnoxious effects like making yourself or Bowser invisible, huge healing HP, the works really. The silver lining here though is that Bowser's AI can be manipulated with recoil damage, while Kami is guaranteed to attack turn 1. So after a power bounce drops Kami down to 29 HP, she and Bowser will then do 6 and 4 damage to Mario respectively, putting him firmly in danger and activating Power Rush. A second Power Bounce on Kami would do an additional 33 damage, knocking her out in the first two turns. Meanwhile, we're ready to bring the scissors to Bowser's paper and dehorn him. Call me sick, but hey, I like the thrill of the hunt. Bowser will always spend his first three moves doing the same moves. First, Brief Fire, next Bite, 
lastly ground pound. From there, his AA will be entirely random. The quirk here comes from when you introduce recoil, which we can utilize whether through super guards, which I can't do, or items like vault shrooms or spike pouches. Zap tap is also workable, but that would mean going into the pit of one of the trials, and I'm trying to avoid leveling up more than necessary. You could tell because only now we've reached level 11. Returning to Bowser though, I actually double dipped the Vote Shroom I'm using against him alongside a Slow Shroom to keep Mario alive so that he doesn't die immediately after getting hit. What you'll see now is that Bowser will not progress to using a different move for the rest of the battle. He refuses to use another move until he can get through using each move at least once interrupted. And barring any disturbances like Fog or Stray Light electrifying him, he's as good as done. A few more power bounces later and we say it so long. Hey Bowser? So, an admission. When talking about the Shadow Queen, I tend to wait on scripting her fight until I've actually fought her. I can never predict this boss. She's just so unpredictable and strong that the only way to fight her demands directing accordingly. And here's the kicker. This fight is being scripted before I even pick up my Wii U gamepad and start recording even a single second of gameplay. That's because even though the Shadow Queen is such an intimidating boss, Mario's just cracked. His first couple of turns are just spent jumping in the Shadow Queen. The damage she does to him doesn't matter at all. In fact, I encourage you not to guard at all if you have my badge loadouts. Once she buffs herself, I heal myself the max HP, and the dead hands will dogpile on me and plant me in the perfect pair of position. Power bounce here, and the first phase is over and done with. She'll be invincible now, but a boost sheet to protect myself followed by any old item to strike the Shadow Queen and progress the fight means it'll just be a few more attacks until we initiate the true final battle. The outcome of this fight can be either slow or fast, but there's no doubt Mario is going to make Minz be out of her. If she attacks with her left and right hands, guarding all three hits will guarantee Mario hits peril, where you can just focus on slamming the Shadow Queen with power bounces until she dies. We have no shortage of live streams after all. Unfortunately, I got the one result which guaranteed I could not enter peril on turn two, where the Shadow Queen summoned her dead hands and dragged me into the dark. Still, she didn't take as much advantage as she could have, and swapped to her left and right hand turn 2 where she began to charge, giving me a free pass to keep attacking while in danger and heal the safety from the guaranteed shine sprite bingo before the Dark Pulse would drop me into peril. I then just boost Sheet and Power Punch where it doesn't really matter what the Shadow Queen does. Not boosting her defense though, it's just two power bounces and she's dead. Yeah, this was sad. Maybe you could say I was playing with fire, but come on, she's a witch. If I didn't leave her burned by the end of it, I'd hardly be doing my due diligence. So as you can plainly see, Mario has no real problem beating the main game. And that's why I'm not ending the video yet, because there's still an optional challenge we can complete just to say there's nothing left. It's time to clear the pit of 100 trials. Now Mario's partners have about a snowball's chance in hell to actually clear the entire dungeon, including defeating Bone Till at the very bottom. It's a very different story for Mario, however, who managed to hold on to so many items throughout the game, he actually ran out of inventory space with the shops. So after going back into the Palace of Shadow the scavenge was left that could potentially be used, I then went into the pit of one of the trials for the purpose of getting the strange sack. The first few levels are about as easy as you'd expect. Here we have Galoombas, Spinias, Spanias, Dullbones, and Fuzzies. Galoombas are the only enemy in the single digit levels who don't instantly die to an Ultra Hammer spin, unless they're the enemy you're hitting with the initial spin smash anyway. And they're not surviving a follow up hit from Mario regardless. For the tens, there are Paragalumbas, Dark Puffs, Pokies, Clefs, and Piters. They're stronger enemies, but Mario has a defense to not worry about anything. Fire Drive is also obtained here, and though we already have one copy of this badge, having a second will be handy for a few situations deep down in the pit. It's actually not until the 20s where we find enemies that start even giving out star points. We have spiky Gloombas, Bandits, Boos, Bob Bombs, and Lakitus with their spinies. Your hammer will still do just fine, and if you really wanted to, you can spin smash as your first strike, then equip Spike Shield and use multi bounce to defeat pretty much anything here in record time, whether it's a Boo or a Lakitu. At the end we find Zap Tap, which will be handy for fuzzies and swoops. The 30s involve Dark Koopas, Shady Koopas, Typer Clefs, Parabuzzies, and Flower Fuzzies. Definitely tougher enemies, but any damage they can do is hardly noticeable. Shady Koopas in particular tend to be killed quickly by Spin Jump, and Hyper Clefs are easily dispatched if you first strike with your Spin Smash first. Anything else tends to get shut down quickly, especially when Zap Tap makes Flower Fuzzies harmless. 
After this song, we find Pity Flower, a badge that I never used for this playthrough. Forties are up now, and we have Dark Paratroopas, Lava Bubbles, Poison Pokies, Bulky bob -Bombs, and Spiky Parabuzzies. It's here I remember I needed to actually equip Spike Shield because I'm so used to playing without it. It's mostly multi-bounce, spin smash first strikes, pretty much what you've already heard before. And it's after here we get to the strange sack, leading me to then dip out of the pit and suck up on what items I have left before finally going down the pit for real. Ultra Shrooms, Life Shrooms, Thunder Rages, Shooting Stars, even a drop of Slow Shroom from earlier in the pit. I mean, hey, I didn't buy it. Honestly, this late into the game, I'm okay with buying items from Charlatan now. If I allow myself to use items shot from enemies, then why not? The 50s have Badge Bandits, Ice Puffs, Dark Boos, Moon Clefts, and Red Chomps. Honestly, the most dangerous enemies here are the Ice Puffs, and we can always run and return to the fights with them until enough of them are low to the ground so Final Drive can wipe them out. The other enemies tend to fall prey to our Trident True First Strike Spin Smash and Spite Shield Multi Bounce combo. We also get Double Dip after these are over and done with, which I want because with two Double Dip badges, we can use Triple Dip, allowing us to use three items in a single turn. Would be useful if there were enemies we wanted to guarantee getting defeated with all of the attack items we have. The 60s have Dark Lakitus, Dark Wizards, Dark Craws, noticing a theme here? Dry Bones, and Frost Piranhas, never mind. Enemies here actually are capable of dishing us some respectable damage. Here, we're actually more reliant on jumps, whether normal or spin jumping. Fire Drive is also good for Dry Bones and Dark Wizards when the aim is to wipe out a wave of enemies quickly. And if you remember what Dark Bones was like, it's quickly obvious why that would be wise. Nothing notable to pick up after the 60s are dealt with. Now it's just double dip P which we can't use, and the later badges are of no real value either. Though I also pick up some maple syrup to drink because I have a sweet tooth and don't feel like grabbing the ice cream I have 20 feet away from me in the freezer. And yeah, only now I'm using an Ultra Shroom. Level ups can carry you far and it really promotes scrooging. Now on to the 70s, we have Dark Koopa Trolls, Wizards, Phantom Members, Swoopulas, and Chain Chomps. Zap Tap hard counters Swoopulas, and Dark Koopa Trolls are actually much less dangerous than Dark Cross because the poor things can be flipped over. This makes the 70s surprisingly less dangerous than the 60s, with the only real enemy I think being worth worrying about are wizards. Even Phantom Members just tend to be ice power fodder. The 80s are amongst the most dangerous enemies we'll find in the game with Spunyas, Dark Thrustles, Piranha Plants, and Arantulas. Enemies have high attack power, which makes having high defense a priority, and we have fights now where our low HP often finds itself being uncomfortably low, and leveling up becomes sparse enough where we can actually find ourselves in danger of losing life shrooms. In one fight, I actually did lose a life shroom because I needed to do 16 damage in a single hit to wipe enemies out instantly, and the brain fart making me forget all or nothing is an option left me being one damage short and winning a fight with a piranha plant and a ratula with one life shroom being sacrificed. With the one mistake aside, the 80s weren't too bad. Any other instances when I fell into peril, I made sure to make them count, and that sharpened up a lot to make sure of that. The 90s were... something. We have Elite Wizards, Bob Oaks, Poison Puffs, Swampires, and the dreaded Amazing Daisies. The first fight here against two Elite Wizards and a Swampire was easy picking since we were in peril ahead of time. And the Swampire is Zap Tap Fodder, so you know how that went. Then the remaining fights in the 90s all had Amazing Daisies. The very next fight has two Poison Puffs and an Amazing Daisy. What makes these weeds so dangerous? Well, I'm not going to show you. Chests no 20 damage is more than half my max HP. So I'm running away and re-entering this fight until the poison up that's still alive drops to the ground so that I can use my peril status to wipe both it and the daisy out in one attack. It may cost 10 FP to use a strong enough fire drive to wipe them both out, but trust me, it's worth it. And yeah, I'm using the spin smash first strike again. After that, 3 buff bulks and get this. Another amazing daisy. Not as big a deal though. I just invest in enough attack to wipe the amazing out from a chain of reaction of bob oaks exploding. So far, the Amazing Daisies have been more just star point splurges than anything actually threatening. But I'm still always worried about the possibility of finding the dreaded Double Daisy- Oh. A mover. On level 94. Well, that's anticlimactic. So I guess I can just skip to level 99 where we fight five elite wizards. Good thing I packed those shooting stars, huh? But that's a pit of 100 trials. At least up to Bone Tail, being level... 25? We have room to pack tons of badges, so I tack on tons of attack up badges, a flower saver, my happy flowers, and proceed to just go to town. It's actually kind of sad that little strategy there is here. I just repeatedly spin jump. 
I did try Power Bounce a couple of times, but it does barely any extra damage over Spin Jump, and it doubled the FP cost. Just doesn't seem worth it. I just keep using Spin Jump, and when my health got to about half, I slow Shroom. It looks like I'd have to heal again soon, but then I got a Mushroom Bingo and... Yeah, y'all can probably see where this is going. I proceed to Spin Jump some more. Bone Jill heals himself like once, next thing you know, I'm in danger. Bone Jill has less than 25 HP left, and I Power Bounce to finish the Bony Bastard off. Completing the pit of 100 trials in its entirety, still having most of my Ultra and Life Shrooms, all of my Thunder Rages, one Shooting Star, and a ton of other items that just never were needed because my luck is just that good. As per the video title, can you beat Paper Mario the Thousand Year Door with only Mario? Yes, absolutely. He can quite viably solo the entire game by himself. Even without star powers at his disposal. And the best part is that we don't even need an asterisk here, because we don't even need to fight the Armored Harriers in Chapter 3. Honestly, it should be no surprise. If partners like Bobbery and Vivian can beat Paper Mario with a thousand year door under these rules, even though it's technically impossible without cheats, I think it's fair to say Mario can. The end of his main game journey left him at level 11, which is absolutely fantastic, but after venturing down the pit, his level skyrocketed to a whopping level 25, which is higher than even that of Koops. It really doesn't matter how high his level is by now though, the fact he was able to solo the pit of 100 trials makes him well beyond measuring his ranking amongst the partners looking purely at levels. And he's rather decisively proven to be the best character in the game. As a matter of fact, I'd even go a step further and say that this was not a difficult challenge. I mean, between the ease of setting up peril with sufficient knowledge, the lack of needing to worry about the survivability of a dead weight, and the massive variety of options at his disposal, Mario's utterly cracked. Kinda makes me wish now that I did try this using only my hammer. I mean, I did, but I was allowed to buy items in that challenge. More than anything else though, I wish my partner only challenges were more interesting to people. Because nowadays, to feel any real challenge, I have to play this game without Mario at all. Though I guess there is no denying that good luck had a hand in being able to make it as far as I could. And I think how a playthrough would go with only my hammer would be reflected pretty well, if not even harder, if we saw Koops be the main star. Which I also already did. But this video was already really long, and I doubt you'd want to watch another one right now. So instead, I will thank my channel members. Starnova, Splash A, especially Andy Switchy and Nintendo 60 Jorts, your generosity is massively valued here, and I will always be grateful for your charity. Especially with how difficult times are nowadays. And to all my other viewers, I thank you for watching. See you next time for... I guess no action commands, unless I try to put up another random video as I experiment to find other stuff that my viewers would want to watch.